Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln, which is in England. And in this video, I wanted to actually have a look at the final four phases of giant planet formation. So this actually is going to jump in kind of midway of the planet formation process and look at the end part of how the actual giant planets form as opposed to from the whole process, basically, because actually is a crossover between terrestrial planets, rocky planets and giant planets. And I'm only going to have a look at the actual the final part of the giant planet, because that's kind of where they start to deviate away from one another. So what are giant planets? Well, quite loosely, they can be defined as having a mass greater than 0.1 times the mass of Jupiter or 30 times the mass of the Earth. Now, I've put four of our large planets here in our solar system. Now, really, there's only two planets there that are probably known as like, you know, more classic giant planets, which is Jupiter and Saturn. Uranus and Neptune are more ice giants, and the formation for those is actually a little bit different. There's something else has to happen with those to get ice giants compared to your um, more typical gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. But the ones I'm really interested in here for this video is more related to like Jupiter sort of size planets. And those ones we've also discovered in other systems as well. So the general idea for planet formation is that planets form in these protoplanetary disks around young stars. So when the stars form, they collapse from a gas cloud, they actually then flattens down to a rotating disk. And whilst the star is still contracting and growing in the centre, which is a protostar, it's not a star at this point, the planets actually form in sync with the, the central star. And then when that star forms, it blows away all the gas, and the planets have to form in that time frame. So it's a bit of a constraint, really, on how fast planets need to form. And there's a few different methods in, well, mechanisms in how to form giant planets and they all have different time frames interestingly so the two main models then for giant planet formation are disk instability and core accretion and the disk instability model which is not the one i'm looking at in this video is where you have a localized collapse or fragmentation of this protoplanetary disk and then you get a planet grow in that disk quite fast actually, they can happen very, very quickly, but it's because of a local gravitational instability. So it collapses under its own gravity basically and you get a very fast growth of a giant planet. The one I'm interested in for this video is the core accretion model. That's a much slower process and it's from the slow accu accumulation and growth of a planet from dust and gas over time and then you end up with a, a gaseous envelope. And that's the one I'm interested in for discussing for this particular video. So if you actually have a look at the, the time frames and the certain types of planets you can form, then rocky planets, terrestrial planets, and giant planets kind of have a common route up to a certain point. Because we assume that giant planets, at least in the core accretion model, they'll have a rocky core. And then they then actually continue to grow to get to giant planet size, whereas a rocky terrestrial planet would kind of taper off and you end up with a terrestrial planet in the centre. This is the route we're interested in here. So there are four phases, basically, for this giant planet. Or the, Once you get to rocky planet, anyway, there's then four phases. The first phase somewhat resembles terrestrial planet formation, and you get to a point where you have a, a mass of that planet, or the rocky core, which is like 5 to 20 times that, of the Earth, and it's capable of retaining a gas-like atmosphere. So that's the sort of first phase that we have. Now at this point here, what's happening is it's accreting, which basically means it's kind of accumulating or uh, there's material falling on it that's helping it to grow in mass, of planet planetesimals, which are like, they're not planets, they're probably asteroid sort of size, so they're not, they're kind of like mini planets, those until all of the solid mass within its gravitational reach has been depleted. So the bigger the object, the bigger the gravitational reach or influence it's going to have, and it will then basically accumulate all of the solid mass 
in its gravitational reach and it then reaches something known as like the isolation mass because once it's done that it's essentially then isolated because there's no more solid mass in the local area that it can then accumulate from um, the phase one actually then ends at the point when all of those planetesimals in its feeding zone have been depleted basically so it reaches the maximum mass from accreting all of that solid mass basically its feeding zone and the feeding zone is going to be like an area around its orbit that it has a gravitational influence on so smaller objects that get close enough are going to be influenced and then it can actually use those to grow bigger and once it's depleted all of those then that is kind of like the end of this point here really and then you go to phase two so phase two is where you get a slow envelope accretion so then you've got this outer like gaseous envelope around the central core then you get a slow increase in the rate of accretion of gas onto that core this does happen alongside some planetesimal accretion as well so you've got those smaller like asteroid sort of size objects still reaching the core whilst the gas envelope starts to grow as well so it's taking the gas in the local area to grow as well as smaller solid objects and this plot here basically shows you well, the, the, the mass as a function of time for different parts here. So I'll notice them for a minute. But basically, you can see over time, there's a sudden spike in the, in the mass of this giant planet. It starts with the central core, which is quite low mass, quite steady. And then you get a sudden spike, really. And this happens because of a runaway effect where it just increases and increases in rate. So once the core reaches this critical mass, the envelope accretion actually exceeds the, the rate that the core is growing. So the actual the outer envelope accelerates in its mass faster than the core. And this is actually when it transitions to the next phase as well, which would be your phase three. But in the phase three part, you end up with this runaway accretion. So it starts to grow bigger. And because it's actually got a larger mass it has a larger gravitational influence around it and then the gas mass grows even greater so actually what happens is the outer envelope is much much faster rate of growth than the core and actually at some point the core actually stops growing as well because there's no it can't grow anymore from the solid mass nearby so you can see how the total mass there start to taper off now that would be when you get to the phase four but you can see in phase three, you get a sudden spike in the mass of the gas and the total mass of the planet. The mass of the core actually doesn't change much. That core mostly grows in the first part and it's the gaseous envelope which really accelerates in the rate of formation basically as we get to the phase. So phase three, this is your rapid envelope accretion. This is where you get a very rapid increase in the mass of that outer gas envelope here and it basically continuously increases basically you get this runaway effect and the core doesn't necessarily grow that fast anymore the the outer envelope actually overtakes it massively here you get a runaway effect now at this point here it's in a quasi hydrostatic equilibrium so that basically means that this outer envelope is gravitationally collapsing it was well, not collapsing but it's contracting and that, what that does then is it allows more gas in so it can then grow even more. But it's also starting to be balanced by outward radiative pressure. So whilst this is occurring, the planet is actually warming up. Now, there's a few mechanisms that actually can generate heat in this, which I'm not going to cover here, but basically. But there will be some outward radiative pressure from the planet, which starts to kind of semi-balance it. So I say it's a it's quasi hydrostatic equilibrium because it's not exact equilibrium because it's still letting gas in but it means that it's kind of somewhat balanced by gravitational forces and outward pressure as well so eventually the disc itself this 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 gaseous disc can't actually supply enough gas to keep up with the rate of contraction of this envelope so this outer envelope is contracting more then the gas is actually coming back in to fill it up. And then what happens then is the, the accretion rate of that outer envelope starts to really taper off and slow down because it just can't supply 
enough gas to it to keep up with that really fast growth rate of revenue. Now, this generally occurs when the planet starts to form a gap in the disk. Now, gaps in disks are very, very important, actually, because they relate to planetary migration, which is, again, in a different video completely. But it allows planets to move closer to the star and possibly further away. And it can explain why we find gas giants very close to their star, which we would call a hot Jupiter, because they don't form close to the star. But once they actually start to manipulate or they alter the disk that they actually are in, they can actually migrate in the disk as well. And a gap is very important for that. It just gravitationally, it distorts it enough that it can clear a gap out in its orbit. Now, gas can still pass over that gap, but it's, the amount of gas is obviously throttled back quite a lot. So it massively reduces down the accretion rate compared to previous rates. This is, again, another reason why this accretion rate really tapers off and it starts to slow down because you've only got a very small stream of gas making it onto the planet now. But it can go across the actual gap itself. Now, when we're in this phase here, the core mass pretty much remains constant. It doesn't really grow much. And part of the reason for this is that any protoplanets or planetesimals or these smaller asteroid-like objects, if they do make it to this giant planet to help it grow in mass, they actually don't make it to the central rocky core. They actually are broken up by gas drag, dynamic pressure instead, and they actually just stay in the outer envelope. They never make it to the core. So the actual central core mass, if we're assuming it's a solid rocky core, doesn't really grow. And it, actually contributes to the outer envelope instead. Now what this actually does is a significant amount of this mass, this solid mass, dissolves in this outer gaseous envelope and it enriches it with heavy elements. And we have found this with gas giants uh, around other stars, so exoplanets, very large exoplanets, we found unusual heavy elements in their atmosphere. And this could be that this is what's happening here. So we've got these smaller objects being dissolved in the outer envelope and not contributing to the central mass of the core instead. Now, phase four is the final phase. And at this point here, then gas accretion basically stops. There's no more, it doesn't grow anymore. And the mass actually remains constant. And instead, this outer envelope starts to contract and cool down instead. So there's no more increase in mass. But instead, its size will change because it will contract under gravity and it then begins to cool as well. Now, why does the gas accretion stop at this point? Well, it could be due to a few reasons, actually. One of those is that the actual disk itself it dissipates. So the background image here is actually due to photo evaporation. So that means that let's say the, the star itself actually becomes a star. It's no longer a protostar it then becomes a star, you have a, a significant stellar wind, like a solar wind that blows away or photo evaporates the, the gas in the disk. That then means that any planet in that disk, its growth is gonna completely stop. Also, if you end up with a, um, a gap that's unbridged, then it can't actually take any of that gas from the disk, so that can also prevent it. Now, the interesting thing here that I'll finally mention is that the time frames for this are quite long. And the time frame for a disk, they sometimes can be shorter than the actual formation rate of one of these planets, specifically like the ice giants. If they're further out in the disk, the time frames to form them become greater and greater for various different reasons. So we need a different mechanism to form those, which again is not the point of this particular video, but it just highlights that actually this is one of the problems with core accretion is that the time frames can be longer than the lifetime of the disc before it actually dissipates. So thank you for watching and if you enjoy do check out some of the other videos.